Today we are going to be starting a new sermon series, but before we do, I want to pray. All right, let's, let's pray for the Lord's blessing. Lord, thank you for the truth of your word. We need it. We don't want to build our lives on shifting sand. Rather, we want to build our lives on solid rock. So, Lord, we come to you. You, Lord Jesus, you say you are the way, the truth, and the life. And so, Lord, we want to build our lives upon you, on what you teach, on what you do, on what you have done. So, Lord, as we're coming here now to look at Ephesians, we pray that you will open our minds, open our hearts to take in everything that you want us to be able to take in this morning. Lord, as in the case for today, would you expand our imaginations? Would you open up our our minds to be, yeah, I guess, stretched, to wonder, to take in a bigger picture than perhaps we might have taken in before? And yes, human imagination is very um, elastic, very stretchable. But Lord, what we're asking really is for you to do something that only you can do. And so Holy Spirit, please, would you come and move in our hearts and in our minds, all of us, enable us all to grow and grasp onto spiritual concepts which are life-giving and foundational for life in Christ. And Holy Spirit, would you please empower me as I preach And as I seek to convey things that I've studied, would you speak through those simple human words that I have? Would you speak through them and bless each person who listens and hears? Bless all of us as we hear, Lord. Would you take these words, the words of truth, and apply them with power to our lives? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are going to be walking through the letter to the Ephesians. This letter offers a breathtaking view of the entire landscape of Christianity. If you can imagine, you know, some letters in the New Testament, some, t- some things you find in the Bible are like close-up view, like walking, sitting here in this building. The piano is a certain distance from me and so on. You see a certain perspective from this level. But then you zoom out and you zoom out and you zoom out. So imagine that you're, say, 30,000 feet in the air and you're looking down on whole vast stretches of landscape, right? Let's say you go even further out and let's say you could see all of Canada, right? In one view. That's pretty high up, I think. I'm not sure you could do that and still be in the atmosphere. But anyway, the letter to the Ephesians is that high. It gets that broad in in its expanse. It's the big entire view picture of Christianity. That's what Paul's doing here in Ephesians and especially in Ephesians chapter 1. Okay, so the whole purpose of the book of Ephesians is about who we are in Christ. It's about our identity as people who are in Christ. Who are we together in Christ as the church? It's not an individualistic book. It's a group thing. We are together the church in Christ. One commentary says that the book of Ephesians tells us how to be the church. So who are, who are we in this world as the church. As for the structure of the book, it's actually really simple. Ephesians is probably my favorite book because it's so huge on the one hand and so straightforward on another. The structure of the book is very simple. Chapters 1 to 3 are about the gospel, what we believe. Chapters 4 to 6 are about how we live it out, what we believe, how we live it out. Boom. One book. All right. So as we get into the passage this morning, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 to 14, I want to invite you to first think about how vast are God's blessings for us in Christ. Remember, we're taking the 30,000, the 40,000 foot view of all of Christianity right here. Okay? So think about how vast God's promises and blessings are for us in Christ. Think about all that God has done for us in salvation, what he has done for us as believers, what he has done for us at the cross through Jesus Christ. Get those concepts in your mind, okay? 
and then prepare to have them stretch even further. Okay? To be bigger. Okay? So Ephesians chapter 1, starting at verse 1. We'll go to verse 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in, con in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of his glory. This is the word of God. I want to encourage you to keep your Bibles open as we go through this. Perhaps you have your physical Bible in front of you or your phone or, or whatever. Uh, keep it open. As we start... Let's recognize that Paul seems to loosely organize his thoughts here around the three persons of the Trinity. Verses 3 to 6 are largely talking about the Father. Verses 7 to 10 about the Son. And then verses 11 to 14 about the Holy Spirit. It's not like Paul's really trying to write an early version of the Apostles' Creed or anything, but he does clearly seem to recognize the three persons of the Trinity and how each has distinct and important roles in our salvation as the church. I also want you to see something absolutely essential. I want you to see that everything comes together in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. Did you see how often that phrase comes up? It shows up 11 times in these 14 verses, in the Greek, in the English, in the NIV that I've just read from. It only shows up nine times because of how they choose to translate. That phrase, in Christ or in him, shows up nine times in the NIV here. That's a big deal, <laughs> okay? This book of Ephesians presents union with Christ, which is a doctrine that you'll, you can read about in theology. This book presents union with Christ more powerfully and more fully with more detail than any other New Testament letter. Even Romans. This specifically talks about being in Christ a lot. And this concept of being in Christ is so crucial, so important, that I really cannot stress enough how strongly it is. Okay? It is the foundation for everything else in the whole letter. It is right at the heart of what it means to have salvation and what it means to be a Christian and to follow Jesus. All the blessings that we have from God, everything good, comes to us because we are in Christ. So what does it mean to be in Christ? I was wrestling back and forth with how to describe this. And I think I'm going to try to describe it this way. In TV shows or movies, there are situations where a rich and powerful person can get into an exclusive party or an exclusive club and no one else can get in. You have to be like a certain person or you have to be on a certain guest list in order to get in. Right? Okay. So the rich and powerful person in these TV shows or movies can walk right in and then he points to these other people and says, they're with me. And they can walk in too. Anyone else tries to get in and those big guys, you know, the bouncers, bounce them right out, right? Not a chance, buddy, right? 
So the rich and powerful person walks in and he says, they're with me. So as far as anyone at the party is concerned, these people are included in him. That is, they're inseparably connected with him. That is how Paul is describing our connection with Christ in this whole letter. If someone is in Christ, they are included in him. They are inseparably connected with him. Whatever is true for Christ is also true for us because we are in Christ. We are with him. Theologically, if you want to look at this from a slightly more refined perspective, all of us, all human beings on planet Earth throughout history are represented by someone, either Adam, we are in Adam, and therefore we have all the stuff that he earned, which is death and condemnation, or we are in Christ and therefore have all the stuff that he earned. We are either in Adam or in Christ. Paul goes into great detail in this in, in Romans chapter 5, for example. So we are in Adam and therefore dead in our transgressions and sins. Oop, that's chapter 2. Or we are in Christ and have eternal life forevermore. Right? Okay. So to be in Christ means that we are represented by or included in or with Jesus Christ. Jesus says, they're with me. Rather than belonging to Adam or ourselves. In Adam, we would never be allowed into God's presence. But in Christ, we can walk right in because we're included with him. That's what it means to be in Christ. Okay, let's look at verse 3. Paul often starts his letters with praise or worship to God. And this is the most praise-minded or praise-focused start to any of his letters. By far, the first 14 verses are all praise, praise, praise. It's interesting. Just verse 3 is really, is really interesting. In the Greek, the word isn't praise be to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's blessed be or blessed is. So, blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. The blessing or, or, the, or the glory of God has been shown in bringing us in, in, into salvation in Christ. It's interesting how all, all three of those words work together that way. So what are these blessings in Christ? We've been giving every, given every spiritual blessing in Christ. What are they? The entire rest of this morning, we're going to be talking about those really quick. We're just going to be skimming the surface of each. Verse 4. First one is this. He chose us in him, in Christ. The Father chose us in Christ before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Chose. He didn't stumble upon us. It's not like he flipped a coin and said, all right, I guess it's those guys. No, he looked at us and set his affection on us and said, you are mine. He chose us before creation ever happened. Before he said, let there be, he had already chosen us. It's interesting. He chose us to be holy and blameless in his sight. I want to pause here and say, yes, God has called us. He has commanded us to live holy and blameless lives. But here, Paul is not talking about our responsibility as believers. Certainly, we do have responsibility. Yes. And he's going to get to that later on in the letter. But here, Paul is simply talking about what God has done before any atom ever existed. And certainly before Adam existed. Yeah, I'm a dad. I'm allowed to do dad jokes. All right. Um, so yeah, God chose us in Christ before Adam or atoms existed. Okay? God has chosen us, set us apart from before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless. By God's sovereign choice, we will be holy and blameless. What does that mean for us? Quite simply this, and I'll talk about myself here, I am often frustrated by my own weak faith. Regularly and frustratingly so. I'm often discouraged that I'm slow to repent, so quick to anger, so quick to idiocy, a hundred different ways that I'm frustrated with myself. 
I'm so quick to forget all that God has done for me. And I preach about it. Man, you'd think if someone could get it right, it'd be the guy who's always studying this stuff, right? But I, I don't got it together. No. What I need to remember is that the sovereign God of the universe has already decided that I'm going to be holy and blameless because of what Jesus has done. And if he's decided it, guess what? It's going to happen. In Philippians 1 verse 6, Paul says that he is confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it through to completion on the day of Christ Jesus, when Christ returns. So the point is, God isn't finished with me yet. And he's not finished with you either. It's not over yet. When you encounter roadblocks in your faith, when you come up again and again and again and again with your own idiocy the way that I do, then just remember, God isn't done yet. He has chosen you to be holy and blameless. And it's going to happen. God is bending his considerable, his unlimited might and wisdom to this purpose, which is to transform you to be holy and blameless, a suitable bride for Jesus Christ. And he's doing this not by your effectiveness or my effectiveness, but by the perfect blood of Jesus. It all comes down to the cross. So then this passage, Joshua 1, comes to mind. In light of my own frustrations, our own frustrations with our own slowness of heart to believe, with our own weakness of faith, I think we can read this accurately towards ourselves. God says, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go, because he has chosen you to be holy and blameless in his sight. It's going to happen. Okay, let's go on. Verse 5. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ. Now, I know that many of us don't like the concept of predestination or election. Okay, it feels cold and distant. So, yeah, fine, I get it. But just look at these words. In love, he predestined us for adoption. Predestination is described by love and adoption. There's nothing cold about love and being chosen to be embraced into a family. No one adopts someone by accident. It's a long process and it's difficult. Oh yeah, the cross was that too. The cross was not an accident. The cross was purposeful and intentional. When we were adopted into God's family, that was very personal. He predestined before creation began that he was going to do this and he did it in love. Predestination is about God's love for people who were his enemies. Predestination is about him drawing them in and, being, and deciding to do so before they ever had a chance. Deuteronomy 7, this is interesting. The Lord did, did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples. That's what the Lord says to Israel. For you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your forefathers that she, he brought you out of Egypt with a mighty hand and so on. God chose you. He said, you are going to be part of my family. Before you ever existed, you are going to be part of my family. That's predestination. So verse 6. He did this for the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. When we think about grace, we often tend to think of grace as something that God gives us. Okay, yeah, but I want to encourage us to not think of it so much that way. But how about this? Not something that God gives us, but rather this. Think of grace as God giving us himself. We desperately need God for everything, and he has given himself to us. That is grace. And that is exactly the cross. That's exactly what happened at the cross. And he has freely given himself to us in Christ. It's interesting, Luke 11, it's one of my, um, well, I have a lot of favorite passages. 
But this one comes up a lot in my mind. God isn't stingy with his gifts. God isn't stingy when he gives us himself. Jesus says, Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? No, none of you guys would do that. So if you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, then how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The Father delights to give good gifts to his children. He isn't stingy. He's extravagant. He has freely given us grace in the Son who he loves, Jesus Christ. Zephaniah 3, the Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He delights in his kids. He gives us everything we need. He freely gives us himself in Jesus Christ. He rejoices over us with singing. Again, we're just skimming the surface of so many of these glorious and deep things. Verse 7, in him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood. Redemption is this thing was either locked away as a slave, unaccessible, totally not its own, and to redeem it is to pay the price to, to take it back. And that can be with an object or with a person and with how they did slavery back in those days and so on, right? But in redemption, you pay a price to get something back. In him, we have redemption through his blood. The blood of Jesus was the price. And as a result, we have the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. So often we carry around this weight of, oh, I did this and this and this. Yes, we did those things. That's why Jesus died on the cross. In him, we have the forgiveness of sins. Romans 8 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because God did what we could not do. He paid for our sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. We have the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Verse 8, this grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. The, the word lavished is uh, literally to abound or to be rich. So he richly poured out extravagantly on all of us the grace that we need through Jesus Christ at the cross. There is no end to God's grace for you in Christ. 1 John chapter 3 says, How great is the love that the Father has lavished on us, that we would be called children of God. See, it's all coming together, right? We were just talking about adoption. How great is the love that the Father has lavished on us, that we would be adopted into his family because we've been predestined and it's all been affected to us or it's all been brought into, brought into effect by the blood of Jesus Christ shed for us on the cross. Everything comes together in Christ. Everything. Verse 9, And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ. This phrase, made known, really, it, it's just, uh, he revealed he, made, he revealed to us the mystery of his will. That, that this is to reveal something that was hidden before, but is now finally known. It's where you say, ah, now I get it. it where, where the idea is locked into place, and it's like, ah, there we go, right? Okay. From the start, God had a plan to redeem the world, and he gave snippets and pictures and previews of it, but no one ever had the full picture. And in fact, he's not fully done with that yet. Christ is still to return. Sin, sin still exists today, doesn't it? We haven't seen the full plan of God's will to redeem the whole world. But here, quick, in summary, is what we've seen so far. God created the world beautiful, glorious, and good in Christ. Right? Um, first, or John chapter 1. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. So God created the world beautiful, perfect, and good in Christ. Human beings sinned against God, messed it up, and already right away, Genesis 3, verse 15, God gives us a preview of the gospel. He says, I'm going to create, I'm going to bring a redeemer. And then he calls Abram. Later, his name is later changed to Abraham. But he says, Abram, follow me. 
And Abram does. We're told nothing else of the story other than God calls him, and then he goes. And then God raises up Moses, who is another type or another preview of what Jesus is going to be like. And Moses steps in, and God works powerfully through him, and God works powerfully through the kings, especially David and others. And then God speaks through the prophets and so on. So all this time, God has been slowly expanding people's awareness of what he's going to do to redeem the world. And finally, he sends his son at Bethlehem in the form of a baby who has come for one singular great purpose, and that is to die on the cross, to pay for our sins. But not only to pay for, to pay for our sins, but also to restore all of creation. And in fact, that's what verse 10 gets to. So God is making known or revealing to us everything that he's been doing all along. Everything centers in Christ. I've said that before, right? Everything before Christ in the Bible looks forward to the cross and resurrection, and everything after uh, Christ looks back on what he has done in the cross and resurrection. Everything centers in Christ. Verse 10. God's plan of redemption is put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. That is to sum up, to, to gather together again. To, he's fixing all things. It's interesting, Colossians chapter 1, Paul says a similar thing. He, Jesus, is the image of of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So when we're talking about Christianity, we're not just talking about fire insurance, about individual people getting saved so that they can go to heaven. That's part of it. But what's, what's in mind with the gospel is so much more than that. The gospel is about nothing less than the healing and restoring of all creation because of what God has done in Christ at the cross. The salvation of Jesus Christ has a global significance. Verse 11. Now we're starting to talk about what the Spirit is doing or has done, the role of the Holy Spirit in this. In Christ, we were also chosen having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. So we've already talked about how we were chosen and predestined. Right? This is something God designed from the start. Verse 13. And you were included in Christ. You, you remember we said, there with me? You were included with Christ with all these people who are in Christ, you were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation. And here's where the Holy Spirit comes. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Seals in that day conveyed authenticity and ownership. The Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit in our hearts confirms that God owns us that we belong to him. The Holy Spirit, verse 14, is a, is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. A deposit is a down payment that guarantees final payment. Here's the first part. The rest is coming. The Holy Spirit is our guarantee. The fact that all believers have the Holy Spirit living within them is proof positive that God isn't done yet that they are saved in Christ. So there's a lot that I could easily talk about, but the, there's a passage from, a, from something that C.S. Lewis said and wrote that really sticks out, and I think this grasps it. Because what we're talking about this morning is the significance of what it means to be in Christ. Everything that he has done is now ours. Everything. And our imaginations are too small, too narrow. Our field of view is too narrow to really get a sense of everything that God has done for us in Christ. And so this passage from C.S. Lewis came to mind uh, from his, his essay, The Weight of Glory. The weight is in the, the heaviness, the weight of glory. 
And here's what he says there. Indeed, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels, so when we consider everything that God offers to us in Christ, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday by the sea. A child making mud pies in the slums has a very small world, a very small imagination of what life is. And that child has said, hey, Johnny, or whatever your name is, hey, Johnny, do you want to come with us? We're going to go have a holiday by the sea. Some of your friends are going to be there. Do you want to come with us? He's like, holiday by the sea? Where's that? I'm happy making this mud pie. Little Johnny, or whoever his name is, sorry if your name is Johnny, (laughs) but little Johnny there making mud pies in the slum, He has no idea what is being offered to him. He thinks it's just, do you want to move from here and go over to here? That's what he thinks. He's like, no, I'm happy where I am, thanks. No, 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 no. What he's being offered is, hey, forget the mud pies. You can have real pies. You can have cake and pizza and whatever. You can come not just in the slums where it's dirty, infested with rats and lice and all that stuff and it stinks. Instead of being there where the stink is so bad that even after you've lived there for years and you kind of get used to it after a while and it's like, well, okay, you just learn to put up with it. Kind of like when you live in a home near a train track, eventually you don't hear the trains. When you're living in the slums and the smell is bad, but you just kind of get used to it, but it's still always kind of stinky. He's, he's living there in the slums and has no idea how beautiful, glorious, free, and fresh it is over by the sea. All of us are like this guy making mud pies in the slums. We hear the gospel. And it's like, oh, that sounds good. Maybe life will be a little bit better in Christ. We are far too easily pleased, says C.S. Lewis. We think that just more of the same but a little bit better is what God offers us in the gospel. What God offers us in Christ is beyond our wildest imaginings. In Christ, everything holds together. Here's another way to put it. God created galaxies, supernovas, stars, nebula, and all those things that I don't know anything about, but that are really big. God created everything. Supernovas, black holes. He created all that. Everything there was created in Christ. Everything that's so vast that you can barely get your mind around it, all the way down to molecules and atoms and quarks, or quarks. I'm told that those exist somehow. (laughs) Everything in that spectrum is in Christ. Everything was created in Christ. And now you and I have been brought in to Jesus Christ, who is healing and restoring all things. And we're thinking, okay, now that I belong to Jesus, can this be a little bit better? Yeah, but we're not getting the picture. Paul's intention here is that people, if you are in Christ, everything is yours. God has given us in Christ every spiritual blessing. So let's expand our minds, expand our our imaginations to embrace the beautiful truth that in Christ everything is beautiful and in Christ everything is renewed. All right? God has shown his goodness and his glory in saving a people for himself, a people who used to make mud pies in the slums, but who are now invited to join him at his palace by the sea. That's what God has done. He's brought us from the slum into glory. And we live in that 
already know. This is the beauty of what it means to be in Christ. And the rest of the letter is going to be explaining, (laughs) attempting to explain what that means. So brothers and sisters, I just want you to know this, that in Christ, you have everything. Can you imagine life without sin, without suffering? That's yours. We don't see it all yet, but we can see a lot of it. It's, and that is the case for everyone who belongs to Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, you are before all things, and over all things you reign. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are the one by whom, through whom, and for whom all things were created. In you, Lord Jesus, we live and move and have our being. So Lord, would you continually draw us back to the beauteous and glorious truth that we are in you, that we belong to you, that we are with you, and that with you we get everything good. Lord, would you make us dissatisfied with lesser offers? Would you make us hungry for you, Lord? Would you open our eyes to see the beauty and the wonder of what you have done for us in Jesus Christ? Would you bring refreshment and life and hope through what Jesus Christ has done and for what we now are and who we now are in him? Oh, Jesus, thank you so much. Would you please continue to expand our minds and our hearts to embrace you more fully? Amen.